Um, who is responsible for many of the classical algorithms that are that, that are ingredients of both the, the quantum speedups uh, as well as the depolarization. So, Thanks for the intro and uh, thanks for the organizers uh, for inviting me. They invited me to give a purely classical talk. I mean, one corollary of that is that it proves that I'm old enough to give a purely classical talk. But uh, this is partly because I don't actually know quantum algorithms so well. Bear with me. Uh, hopefully, you'll find some of it useful. Uh, so here's a starting point. Uh, if you asked anybody in 1990 in theory, maybe even me, I'm not sure, uh, which of the following methods would scale up and get applied to large problems? in 2020. Uh, here are the candidates that you might put them up. Put up. Uh, singular value decomposition, linear algebra, network flow, shortest path, graph algorithms, sophisticated data structures that you've all probably seen, and optimization. Uh, the title gives away the answer to this question, though. Uh, but also, you heard in this talk already mentioned linear algebra as one of those things that potentially quantum could speed up very well. Indeed, that's partly the reason that this talk is um, about these things. So the answer might have, I, I would guess, the answer would have been two and three. Uh, they're a little more discreet, a little, little more current at that point. Uh, but perhaps the answer, as we realize now, is perhaps more one and four. This is arguable, but this, uh, this seems to be the picture. Uh, so that's a motivation to study uh, linear algebra. Uh, there's crucial help here, of course, from centuries of continuous mathematics that plays a big role. Linear algebra is beautifully understood. Um, and in fact, we'll see some problems to do with tensors at the end, uh, not nearly as well understood or uh, theoretically developed as, as matrices in linear algebra. But also, some part of it is owed to these randomized algorithms that I'm going to talk about uh, in, in this slide, and uh, which is already mentioned by Eudin in the first talk. OK, so uh, SVD, singular value decomposition, was mentioned, and some applications here which are different, perhaps, from the applications that you saw earlier in machine learning. Topic modeling, clustering is an application. Learning mixtures of Gaussians, for which, which is a standard statistical model, for which there's a nice algorithm of Paul and Wong, um, which projects things to the SVD subspace and then learns, which is a standard technique in a lot of algorithms. Um, Non-negative matrix factorization is an important area in machine learning where you are given an input matrix. You have to factor it into two matrices with non-negative entries, which are lower rank, okay. approximately or accurately. Both are interesting. And SVD is useful for that. SVD cannot be used directly because it gives negative entries. But this here, you want non-negative. We'll see this uh, negative and non-negative playing a role a little bit later. This is simple uh, for a general audience for you. It's simple. Who, who tosses coins? The algorithm tosses coins. That's randomized algorithms. But average case would have been a probabilistic analysis where the data tosses coins. Here, uh, mostly the algorithm will toss coins, right? The data won't toss coins. Um, now, uh, why randomized algorithms is, again, a simple intro. But there are two points. Perhaps one of them is missed sometimes. Uh, first of all, saving time. Um, n cubed time is expensive for matrix algorithms for large n. But also space, because in the traditional algorithm setup, we assume that the data, the matrix or the graph, is given and in RAM. And in random, in unit time, you can access one edge or one entry of the matrix. Not so when data resides outside because it's too big, right? Time and space are both considerations. A very simple form of randomized algorithm, which we will uh, talk about here, is it just computes on a sample of rows or columns of the matrix. Okay? And, but we insist that we get proven error guarantees, right? Theorems that say not just heuristics, but Something else, perhaps a little more subtle when you first encounter this, is just sampling on the fly. We shouldn't be spending too much time sampling, drawing a sample. For instance, important sampling, sometimes you can spend too much time. So you want to be able to sample quickly on the fly. Now, later in the end, maybe we'll deal with this thing. I may not get to it. The input matrix may be distributed among servers. Randomization will also help reduce the communication. Because it's an extra worry that we can think about. There are two scenarios. Uh, again, quite familiar, but the method is the same. The first scenario, like the web, or more generally in theoretical computer science, one assumes the matrix or the graph exists somewhere, and we are drawing samples from it. Uh, but conceptually different is something like recommender systems, which you're all familiar with, where you don't have the whole matrix anywhere. You only have some entries. Right? But then 
you can pretend that the matrix was got by sampling from a whole matrix. For that, you have to know something about the sampling probabilities which were implicitly used in drawing these samples, right, to prove things. Okay. In the first part, you, you have a probability under your control. In the second part, you don't. But uh, really, we'll think of both as the same. And here, mostly, we'll think of one. We'll think of the probability distributions being under our control. Uh, so the setting, large matrix, N and M large. I want to pick S is the size of the sample. S stands for sample. <coughs> In IID trials, in each trial, we pick a column with some probabilities and scale it and compute only with the sampled and scaled matrix with S columns. So lots of columns, <coughs> a submatrix with S columns, you sample just that and deal with it. Okay. So the problems that we will talk about, maybe I won't get to all of them, but maybe you will. Matrix multiplication is just multiplying two matrices. In particular, even AA transpose is interesting, uh, or generally more. Uh, two different matrices, singular value decomposition, low rank approximation. Matrix sketches where you can represent a matrix in smaller amount of space. Uh, this is again, you talked about the CUR decomposition. I'll, I'll get to that. Um, graphs falsification is a recent, not very recent, 10 year old result of uh, Spielman and Srivatsova, which is beautiful, which actually depends on length squared sampling, as we'll see. Um, linear regression. Finally, uh, I want to talk about tensors, where perhaps there are open questions that people haven't tried to use quantum things to, and maybe that's possible. Maybe. I mean, this is, again, going out on a limb without knowing a lot about it. Uh, two things. No free lunch. You're sampling, so you can't get exact answers. You're going to make errors, right? But we'll prove error guarantees. OK, good. Uh, so not, I don't want to impose too much notation on you, but a little bit. Uh, Frobenius norm squared is the sum of squares of all the entries of the matrix, and spectral norm is the maximum of all unit length vectors of AX. So how much A dilates a vector in, in, in the worst direction, maximum direction? A is always M by N. S is always the number of samples. That much for notation, no more. Um, OK, so now I'm going to state for you some results uh, and tell you what, what sampling is going to go on, and you can think about how quantum lead, some of this, this has been improved quantum lead. In fact, the next talk by even might be uh, it's some of her results and other results that might be on that. We'll see. Okay. So we seek an approximation of rank K to a matrix A. The best approximation you can find by classical linear algebra is by finding what's called a singular value decomposition, which is like spectral decomposition, except the matrix doesn't have to be symmetric. And there's an error. I'm going to allow an error because I don't want to spend time to do the exact thing. So the error I'm going to allow is some small constant epsilon times the Frobenius norm. And this theorem simply says, with number of samples which doesn't depend on the size of the matrix, that's very important. The number of samples S is independent of the size of the matrix. It depends on this epsilon. It depends on that K, only those. The matrix could, in fact, be infinite. Uh, we'll see examples of that. That's also actually interesting in practice, provided the sampling is done with probabilities proportional to the squared length of the columns. So you take the columns. These are real matrices I'm talking about. Take the columns, sum of squares of the entries. Probability of picking that column should be proportional to that. Which is called length squared. Sorry? Take for the length of the column. Yeah, just the length squared of the column. Euclidean length squared. You're sampling. You sample the whole column. Sample the whole column. Yeah, sample the whole column. So. I pick whole subsets of columns here. You could also do other things, but yeah. Uh, so it's only interesting. It's not going to always give you a good result. See, if I tell you that I have an M by N matrix, I draw number of samples independent of M and N, I can do everything. You shouldn't believe me, obviously, right? Because there's M and pieces of information there. So it's going to uh, get an error. And it's interesting in, in the case, in, in some in important cases like PCA. This is called length squared sampling. This was in a paper in 98. Uh, there have been many improvements. I put dot, dot, dots here to indicate there's a lot of stuff that I'm not mentioning, and here are some of the people who improved things. Um, there's an alternative scheme. Maybe that's a question. Uh, that was a question there. You could draw instead <coughs> a, draw a sample of entries and set other entries to zero. Okay. So you could specify the matrix, but keep the dimensions. I won't talk much about it. This is some work of Acleoptus and McSherry, and some follow-up work has happened on that as well. But I will just draw whole columns. 
Um, why length squared? Why these probabilities? It turns out they are very nice probabilities for a very simple reason. So suppose I want to compute AA transpose. You can write it as a sum of outer products of columns of A times the rows of A. It's easy to see. And we're going to estimate this sum, which is sum over n things, by drawing a sample. So IID trials. Now, I'm going to do IID trials, but not with uniform probabilities. I'm going to pick column J with probability PJ. And I ask myself, what are the best PJs? <clears throat> Uniform sampling is no good because a matrix could have one important column and zero everywhere else. And if I draw samples, I'll always get zeros, right? And you can convince yourself if I only see zeros, the only thing I can say about the matrix is it's all zeros, which is just not going to be a good approximation. So I have to do something. I've got to weight the heavy columns more, and I'm going to weight it by length squared. Um, first of all, to make the uh, estimator unbiased, it's good to divide by the probability. So the expectation is right. This is standard. But the more important thing is some calculus, which I won't do here, but little calculus shows you that length squared probabilities minimize the variance. So there's a good reason to use length squared. It's just the one that minimizes the variance. Simple calculus. Okay, so that's why we use length squared. Um, <clears throat> so then you can prove something like this, where the error goes down as the number of samples goes up to infinity. Okay. This is for AA transpose. Uh, that length squared minimizes the variance. Uh, so this was in that paper. We could also do matrix multiplication using that in order star n squared, star involves factors depending on s. Okay. So um, matrix multiplication you can, of course, do better than n cubed, but n squared is not known, but um, uh, this can do approximately in n squared. Okay. Uh, data handling and pass efficient madman. So this is another uh, question that comes up. Massive data too large to be stored in RAM, right? That's I talked about in the beginning. A simplified model is you measure RAM time, space, and number of passes. So I cannot randomly access an entry of the matrix, but I can access the matrix, randomly access one entry if I want by making an entire pass. It's very costly to access the matrix. You have to make a pass sequentially, right? So you can count the number of passes. All these algorithms are two pass algorithms. You can make them one pass if there is structure. Uh, you can compute the length squared in one pass, and pass two, you can draw a sample. So you, and uh, there are ways of doing this with streaming and less number of passes by now. Uh, again, I won't mention those, but um, so you can also do the following. I picked S columns. Having done that, I could pick a subset of S rows out of those. And I could only work on an S by S matrix, constant size matrix. But the proof that that gives you an error guarantee is much more complicated. Okay. But it's true that, you, so you can call this a constant time algorithm, where the running time does not depend, after you've sampled, does not depend on the size of the matrix. Sorry, so, so what does your sampling look like then? You, you want to sample columns? And so I get a tall, skinny matrix. And out of that, I sample some rows. Right. So, and, and length squared. Do that simultaneously, so you don't first sample. Them. No, I, I, I don't know a way of doing it simultaneously, for which I have a proof that the error is bounded. Okay. The proof gets pretty hairy if you do both samples. Generally, the problem is near singularity. That that. Uh, oh, that's many times. Okay. Oh, good. Right. This we did. Sketch of a matrix. Okay. This is the CUR decomposition I'm going to talk about. So. Can, I, can a sample of rows of a matrix uh, tell you the story about the matrix, the whole matrix? No. Some, the unsampled rows are unsampled. You don't know anything. How about a sample of rows and a sample of columns? The answer is yes. So the result is going to be that for any matrix at all, not for a random matrix, for any matrix, just a sample of rows and a sample of columns tells you an approximation to the matrix. That's what we'll see. Um, but perhaps I'll skip that. Uh, so. Length squared sampling rows and columns now. So you have a matrix. I draw S columns, length squared sampling, right? IID trials, SIID trials, one column each time. I draw some number of rows. It turns out to be not the same S, a root S for a reason, but again, we won't go into But I'll state the result in self-contained fashion, yes? Slide when you're talking about the sketch of the matrix, the error there is also proportional to the Frobenius norm. 
Yeah, you'll see in a minute. I oh. think I, I put down. So, yeah, it is proportional to the Frobenius norm. So the error on the right-hand side is always proportional to the Frobenius norm. It would be awfully nice to make it spectral norm, but it's not possible. And as an example is the identity matrix. You can't approximate every matrix with error. That's epsilon times just spectral norm. Although there are results about approximating with spectral norm error. I'll get to them in a minute. Yeah. So I guess these methods that you're describing here, the ones that give you the complexity, which is some sort of rank times the, the dimension of the matrix, either the column dimension. That's right. Running time is linear only if, yeah, in one of the things, unless you go to constant size. Okay. Unless you go to the more complicated thing of sampling columns and out of that sampling rows, which I didn't touch on because they are not practical, but it's, you know. So, uh, so you, you take rows from the whole matrix now, not just from the columns you picked, from the whole matrix. Okay. So actually, I, I should give you a picture here. I think I have a picture. Here it is. So here are some columns of the matrix. Here are some rows of the matrix. And the assertion is every matrix can be well approximated by a product like this, where I give you the columns and rows, and U is computed from C and R. So given just C and R, columns and rows, um, there is a matrix U you can put in the middle of the right dimensions, which you can compute, so that the spectral norm error between A and C, or C R approximates A, is you should just check it's a correct dimensions, at least C times U times R it is, goes down to zero as the number of samples increases. There is another uh, bound also for the Frobenius norm here, but the right-hand side is always Frobenius norm so far. And again, the dot, dot, dot is really quite a lot of stuff in between, and um, uh, both Sirius and Woodruff have given an optimal time and size algorithm for this. Which, uh, maybe, yeah. Sorry. Is it easy to define what you it is like the matrix you? Is it easy to define? Uh, it yeah, it, it it is defined. Yes, it, <coughs> it it involves a pseudo inverse of C, and some other things even I don't remember now. But but yeah, yes, it is well defined. And it's and it's efficiently. It's, it's efficiently computable from C and R. So if you know your uh, if you remember your SVD, this would have been the singular values diagonal matrix, right? Spectral decomposition should have been the eigenvalues, but it's not diagonal anymore here. Um, I mean, the proof takes a bit of doing. I mean, I, I won't give you the proof, but. And the quality, sorry, and the quality of this approximation is good for? Two. So, so you get some sort of approximation. I'm asking, the quality of this approximation is good for? Yeah, uh, the quality in practice, you mean, maybe? What are the things that you can use it for? Or? Oh, I'll, I'll put down some applications, yeah, yeah. I'll put down some applications, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this it, is uh, not uh, completely useless, but, it's, but, but, it, but, it, but it is. No, but I have a good question. No, but the question is good because the errors are a lot. I mean, because you, you, errors are a lot, yeah. So, traditional SVD, given data matrix, finds the best rank K2 issues, computation time. Um, this was referred to. So, uh, some of the applications, one of the applications is to the health sciences, right? You have a gene patient matrix. Uh, if you did SVD, you can go back and tell the biologist the principal component is 17 times the first patient minus 12 times the 31st patient and so on and so forth, right? Now, biologists don't like making multiple copies of a patient, right? And they certainly don't like subtracting patients because it, it, this is a bad thing to do. But, but anyway, uh, interpolative approximation here. Uh, what CUR does, it tells you here are some patients. You can tell the biologist here are some patients and here are some genes that with these you can represent the whole thing. Actual patients and actual genes, right? That this was work by Dinesh Mahani, this application. The applications in databases by Philistos and others. Um, there are a bunch of other applications of CUR, but I, I didn't put them all up, but here are a couple of representative ones. Um, so let me, uh, let's see, let me go over fast some of this till I come to a slide where I'll wake you up and then you can pay attention. If you, if you miss this, it doesn't matter. So uh, A, a transpose is interesting because it's a variance covariance matrix. Uh, if you have a probability density on RD, the variance covariance matrix is the expected value of xi, xj for x picked according to P, right? Now you can think of a matrix A, which is D by infinity in D dimensions, 
where each point is a column. Each point is a column and it's weighted by the probabilities in some way. The variance along direction v is just this, which is v transpose a squared. So it's uh, how much a magnifies v, right? Uh, sample complexity, how many IID samples do you need to estimate a a transpose? But I'll tell you what estimate means. You want the relative error. We want to sample some columns, a finite sam subsample of columns B of A, so that in every direction, the magnification B gives and the magnification A give or close with a relative error epsilon. It's very important that it's relative error. Uh, in fact, this is actually directly applied for graph falsification, as we'll see in a minute. But you need relative error. That's non-trivial. So along the low eigenvalues, you don't have much error allowed. Um, so this question came up in a completely different context, uh, volume computation. Actually, there's going to be a talk on quantum computing uh, and volume computation later in the day, I see. OK, so the, the thing we proved is all Frobenius norm on the right-hand side. Somebody asked me a question. And now there is actually a better result due to Rudelson version and using um, some nice function analysis. They proved the following. What seems to be a technical improvement, one of the Frobenius norm terms has been replaced by a spectral norm. Okay. But it's actually a much more fundamental improvement. It's not just technical. It's crucial for applications like graph falsification. <coughs> uh, now, there are simpler proofs of this without going into the function analysis technique by using uh, matrix Chernoff inequalities, uh, Hurting Chernoff inequalities for matrices. Um, <coughs> the Rudelson version theorem implies the number of samples order star d, where d is a dimension, is enough for log concave sampling. And this is an important question. Uh, Spielman and Srivatswa used this to do what's called spectral sparsifiers. Let me define that. You have a graph with n nodes and m edges, and you have a node edge incidence matrix. The question that was asked is, can I have a much sparser subgraph which has the same behavior on all the cuts? Okay. And or, same behavior in a minute. I'll mention that. This was a question and ans asked and answered by Benzer and Karger to some extent. A stronger condition was Speedman and Srivatsworth, which says, instead of just cut, I want every vector to be magnified the same amount, roughly, by the adjacency matrix, uh, sorry, node edge instance matrix of A and the subgraph. So a subgraph reflects the magnification of AG well on, in every direction. Same question arises, this. And Rudelson Vashinen gives you this. Uh, but if I can make A of G an isometry, an isometry means it magnifies all vectors, all vectors the same amount. If I can make it an isometry, then I can get better results. Uh, and so maybe it's time to wake up in a way. Uh, so let me tell you this slide, and next it's good to be awake. But uh, so. I'm going to call this preconditioned length squared sampling. This is also something that uh, the next talk might refer to because her work uh, sort of involves this as well. Um, so you have, you have a matrix here. I want to make it an isometry. I want it to magnify every vector the same amount. So I do that by hitting it with the inverse, right? It becomes identity. Uh, we don't have an inverse. These n and m are not equal, so you can hit it with a pseudo inverse. And then we can sample columns of A to length squared probabilities, but from the isometry, from the precondition. We call it preconditioned because it's as if W is a preconditioner for A. It's a standard numerical analysis term. So I take the preconditioned matrix and take length squared sampling on that. So squared lengths of the columns of the preconditioned matrix, right? right? And we repeat this as times. The Rudelson version and result gives you a relative error bound then. It could be shown that that gives you a relative error bound. <coughs> So what seemed like a technical improvement was actually quite important. Okay. This is true for any matrix. Spielman and Srivastava did the following. For adjacency matrix of graphs, they showed that the sampling can be done in linear time. So I want to sample with probabilities proportional to the length squared of W times A. I have to compute W, perhaps, and I have to hit it with A and then sample. So all of this can be done in quasi-linear time is what they showed. But that's only for Laplacians. Now, it's possible for other graphs this can be done. I don't know. Uh, perhaps it can even be done more efficiently quantumly than by 
<coughs> deterministic mean, by classical means? I don't know, but that's, that's some question to ask. Can you, finding the inverse one thing is a standard question, but here all you need is sampling with probabilities proportional to the preconditioned matrix. Maybe that can be done. I don't know. So um, this relates to leverage scores. Let me skip this slide. Um, uh, and uh, do the last paragraph and then the picture. So I here want to draw a sample of columns of A with probabilities not proportional to squared length, but the square of the volume of the simplex spanned by them. Okay. This turns out to be quite important. Uh, both in uh, algorithms and, and probability theory, determinant processes are important. Best illustrated by a picture, right? So here's a picture of why uh, Determinist, determinantal sampling is important. So if you do a search for Jaguar, there are at least two meanings or more, but um, if I plot the uh, uh, car vectors, they might all be close to each other. If I plot the animal vector, they might all be close to each other. If I just did length squared sampling and picked 10 columns out of it, maybe the car is so much more prevalent that I will get nine out of 10 or all 10 out of 10 cars, okay? That's not representative, instead, I might want to know all meanings and sample from them. So what volume sampling says is pick a pair of columns at a time with probability proportional to the square of the area of the triangle they span. So that's the same as the determinant thing. Okay. So I take, if, I, if I take this, this vector and this, one car and one animal, they're almost orthogonal, so they span a larger area triangle than if I pick these two. Right, the, the, the base times height, the height is very small if I pick these two. So volume sampling avoids this problem by taking the volume into consideration. So one question for you, is there a quantum um, uh, efficiency you can gain for volume sampling? So more generally, I want to pick, I'm give, I give you a set of um, vectors and I want to pick a subset of K of them with probability proportional to the volume of the simplex they span, or the determinant of that matrix squared. Okay. Can you get an advantage over uh, just ordinary sampling by enumerating all of them? So here's even a very simple, much simpler question, which must be trivial for most of you, perhaps. That's why I hesitated to put that on slides. But uh, here I have xi 1 through n belonging to minus 1 and plus 1. I want to pick a subset T of N with probability of picking T proportional to the sum of Xi over T squared. Um, now, uh, this is not exactly a special case of that, but this seems the much simpler version. Can you get a quantum advantage here over two to the N times poly? I mean, so you can beat, you want to beat two to the N times poly, which you can easily do. Ideally, you want to beat it by a lot, so you want to get a poly time. Maybe this is familiar. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's possible that some of you have looked at and solved this question. So determinant processes is a general case uh, of this. Now, uh, I think I have two minutes because, uh, yeah, my, maybe Nish is skeptical, but I think I'm <laughs> okay. Two, two quick minutes. So. Tensor is another area which perhaps uh, there are quantum advantages to be had. So uh, tensor means uh, you know three or more dimensional. So we want to maximize one standard problem with tensors akin to singular vectors or singular values, eigenvalues, and so on and so forth. Is you want to maximize the cubic form over unit length vectors. So I have AIJK three tensor, and I want to maximize this thing. Right? Can you do something about that? Well, it turns out you can. Here's the theorem. For any fixed epsilon, can find in poly time a y satisfying this best possible off by epsilon times the Frobenius norm of A, which is sum of squares square root. Same definition. This is sum of squares square root. And this is an algorithm. Uh, again, I won't be able to describe the algorithm, except to say that does involve in the bowels length squared sampling. This, this is also about 10, 12 years old. So, um, I don't know, here's a question. Can you do perhaps this for tensors? Can you get an advantage over either the traditional best algorithm or this algorithm? Um, now, better results are known for tensors if you had structure. Uh, well, I think I, I think I won't go over the rest. Of, there are enough slides. I, 
I'm always afraid of running out of slides, so it's better to. But that's all. I'll stop here. Random projections. Randomized projections for uh, instead of sampling whole rows and columns. So do a Johnson, Lennon, and Strauss kind of projection, and then okay. So the difficulty is that the singular vector, singular value is a singular vector space, right? Is one space, and everywhere else it may be. For instance, maybe rank k, like, or rank one. Okay. If you do random projection, you lose that potentially, right? Because everything gets contracted by the same amount. Project to uh, matrix with rank R. So, are you talking about count sketch and the more recent things, or are you talking about just random? So, there are now methods which, you know, or in the slides I didn't show you, where you can use certain random projections to do something. But a naive random projection is likely to lose, likely to miss the singular vector space, which is the important space, because there's one space hiding out of it's a needle in a haystack. So the haystack as well as the needle will be contracted the same amount by a random projection. You can miss it. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you.